I'm Dr. Cyril Daka, postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery here at Stanford. And everyone here, we've got a wonderful talk lined up for you today by Dr. Jeremy Chow, a cardiologist at Mayo Clinic and visiting scholar at HAI. So he's actively engaged in a collaborative AI projects between the Mayo Clinic and Stanford HAI, working alongside Hassan Adeli and Fei Fei Li. Clinically, Dr. Chow specializes in interventional echocardiography and valvular heart diseases, and is devoted to applying AI to echocardiograms to address clinical problems. And we're delighted to have you here today, uh, Dr. Chow. And he'll be talking about uh, automatic radiology report generation and echocardiography. Uh, so please take it away. Well, thank you. Uh, it's really a privilege to uh, give this talk here. And thank you for, for inviting me like, in the very beginning of my <laughs> First few days. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So today I'm going to talk about uh, our efforts on a uh, AI enabled uh, echo reporting system, uh, mainly addressing the challenges we're facing and the potential solutions we're trying to do. Um, so, about myself, I'm a cardiologist at Mayo uh, and uh, specialize in uh, echocardiography imaging uh, as well as the interventional echocardiography, which is a field that we use echo uh, to guide the newer intervention procedures compared to the conventional open heart surgery, we now do have like minimum based procedures and we use echo to guide that because uh, the operators cannot really see things through the heart, uh, through the body, so we need to use echo uh, in that, uh, which is a pretty new application. And right now I'm a visiting scholar at the HAI and uh, need to mention that this is a two-year program uh, and first time between our cardiovascular departments. Uh, Revision and uh, same for AI, and we're trying to address some gaps that uh, uh, clinicians uh, are uh, not so familiar or not really using AI. Uh, because right now, AI is like a uh, not much faster in the field of radiology and pathology, but the uh, other more clinical oriented um, uh, specialties, uh, AI is kind of behind these two specialties in uh, terms of developments. Right, so sticking with, uh, we talk about heart as an organ. Uh, basically, it's pretty much the most, uh, literally the most vital organ in your body, and as well as the most dynamic organ in your body. So think about it, it actually beats about 70 to 110 beats per minute, and then in the meantime, pumps out three to five liters of blood apart from it. And then there are chambers, uh, anatomical-wise, there are chambers, there are valves, and then connected to the large vessels. So we can think about this uh, compared to all other different organs that we can assess uh, by uh, radiology or imaging approach. Uh, heart is actually much harder to image because we need to consider the dynamics and then uh, like how fast this moves and then uh, how uh, detailed movement and like how much different uh, fine tumor structures and contents in there. So uh, here's why we have echocardiography. Uh, so on the right hand side is an example of our one of our standardized view. Uh, uh, measured from the, uh, the one of the personal windows and give you a relatively longer axis of the heart. So it's a cut of the whole three objects. So basically, a ultrasound study uh, is composed with videos and images. And per study, there are about like a hundred plus video clips and image uh, per study. Uh, and uh, uh, there are uh, overall view of the heart, looming view of the heart, looming view of the valves. Uh, in my case, some small portions that we are specifically interested. Uh, so you can think about this. Uh, that would be a whole study content with different lens, video clips, and then uh, different views of an object. Uh, and the worst part of that is that it is not labeled uh, on any of the uh, individual clips. So it makes the data collection pretty hard uh, to go through this uh, uh, randomly or like a operatively uh, uh, operator dependent uh, views. And uh, however, ultrasound do have its uh, own uh, advantage. It allows us to uh, have dynamic assessment and uh, in the meantime, to provide some quantitative values out from it. Uh, so however, based on ultrasound technology, uh, while it allows us to have high temporal resolution, we also have some limitations or challenges that comes from it. Uh, one of them is the low signal to noise ratio. You can see on the echo images on the right hand side, uh, you look at the heart, but you're, it's not like a uh, some um, clear as you see a brain on the CT or MRI image. So uh, that's the, the difference uh, or the fundamental difference between those. So uh, an important question is like, uh, why do we still need echocardiography? We have so many advanced images. We have cardiac MRI, we have CT, we have nuclear images, which can provide you with uh, kind of more clear and more definitive images uh, or special resolutions. Uh, 
uh, widening scale of the echo. So you can see that uh, we, we really need the temporal resolution uh, part uh, of our strong technology, which can allow you to have a 40 to 50 or even above uh, frame per second kind of temporal resolution. Uh, and well, in the meantime, we're losing some of the anatomical or the spatial resolution from it. Uh, and our sound is portable and it's non radiative compared to CT and input images, and it's very cost effective. So on the right hand side, you can see uh, this is the, um, um, in Medicare patients in the past 10 years, uh, you can see that echocardiography leaves the board uh, by at least like a uh, 20 times compared to other more advanced images. Uh, while that means basically, while we still have the uh, more advantage uh, or advanced imaging modalities, echocardiography are still irreplaceable in our daily practice of cardiology. So as I said earlier, an echo study is actually a very complicated data set. Uh, it contains uh, the standardized views uh, of, of the heart. And it also contains the Doppler image assessment, uh, which assess the uh, blood flow across the vessels or across the blocks. And that's also what we base uh, to judge how bad um, a patient or a uh, patient's hemodynamic status is. And on the right-hand side, you can see that um, a Cardiac study can, uh, ultrasound study can actually contain uh, different views and subclasses of it. Like I said, we will have a standardized view and we may zoom in on that uh, to have a more uh, better spectral uh, resolution to take, uh, to take a look on some more detailed or fine structures. Uh, so that's how a echocardiography study uh, complicated uh, in terms of uh, different views. So, uh, a echo study and the report uh, in at Mayo Clinic, at least uh, we do a study around like a 40, 50 per minute, uh, 40, 50 minutes per study. This would include uh, sonographer scanning and uh, uh, measurements of the study, as well as the interpretation and putting the report together uh, from the interpretive position. Uh, and a standard uh, four to five page report usually contains about three pages that are dedicated to quantitative measurements. So an echo study is actually uh, compared to, say, compared to chest X-ray. Echo study is actually heavily relied on quantitative assessment. As you can see here, uh, we have quantitative assessment parts. We also have a, a heavy portion of uh, quantitative assessment. So uh, in terms of quantitative assessment, uh, it's usually, usually by uh, interpretation vision, looking at the anatomical, anatomical structures or certain features for us to diagnose, uh, for example, cardiac myopathies, Pericardial diseases, or is, is there any uh, wall motion abnormalities? So those are more qualitative ways of assessment on the study. And then uh, we also need to have precise quantitative assessment, including the systolic function, uh, which is the most famous part is the uh, LV ejection fraction. And we have like strain assessment. And then systolic function is one of them. And also we have very detailed uh, hemodynamic assessment that assesses the flow across the heart. Uh, and there are mixed of both uh, areas, uh, some topics including the trigger sizing as well as the valvular heart disease are uh, uh, requiring both qualitative and quantitative uh, assessment to allow us to grade or give diagnosis on certain disease. So, uh, looking at uh, echo uh, automatic echocardiography reporting, it can actually be visualized as a uh, branch of automatic radiology reporting and generation. Uh, and uh, uh, even for an X-ray, chest X-ray based uh, automatic uh, report generation is already a challenge task. Uh, it actually requires uh, advanced um, uh, technology, including all the following fields. Uh, it include including uh, computer vision, medical image analysis, as well as the natural language process. So you can think about like okay, how difficult uh, it would be, especially like in echocardiography, you were containing a lot of um, uh, different non standardized views and uh, different lengths of video clips. So that would be a more difficult problem compared to chest X-ray. So uh, just want to give a quick review on these uh, uh, automatic uh, uh, recording system, uh, based, mainly based on chest X-ray. So uh, in 2016, that was the first effort using um, uh, automatic uh, chest X-ray reporting. That was based on a uh, CNN RN kind of structure. And then uh, starting in 2017, we started to have transformer or granite models uh, being involved uh, in this field. So uh, you can kind of see that uh, earlier approaches, even including some like a multi-objective uh, or like a multi-classification deep learning models, 
uh, but those were like a, uh, in the older days. And now the trend is to use generative AI uh, or transformer models uh, to uh, proceed with this, uh, to tackle this problem. And uh, importantly, uh, most of the available data sets are based on chest X-ray. I know there are some of them who are based on CT and reporting, uh, but I would say maybe like 89% of the data sets were based on chest X-ray. And there's nothing, nothing for uh, uh, echocardiography in terms of uh, public uh, available data sets. So I wanted to review some of the efforts in the echocardiography interpretation uh, automation. So this is the work uh, published by the UCS, UCS group in circulation back in 2018. So uh, they proposed a prototype of a fully automated pipeline for echo interpretation. Uh, so in which they include about like a 14,000 uh, uh, cases. And then they use the VGG-16 uh, pretty straightforward model for their view classification and the disease detection. Uh, and they use a UNEF for their segmentation. Uh, they, they did reach a pretty good result on uh, segmentation as well as disease detection, including uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, amyloidosis, and uh, pulmonary hypertension. Uh, all from all the background diseases uh, with reasonably good um, uh, performance. Importantly, this study did not include uh, Doppler imaging because they want to have the system to be kind of more uh, generalizable, even into a more um, uh, rural area or community hospitals that don't have a uh, uh, specialized uh, sonographer who can do all those uh, uh, detailed Doppler studies. So, and a big shout out to the EchoNet team, uh, which is actually the largest um, uh, available data set for echo image segmentation and diagnosis available right now. Uh, and uh, very recently, the team just published their first uh, randomized counter trial, which is actually the gold standard in clinicians to determine whether device or therapy is useful uh, in, a certain, in treating certain diseases. And then uh, through this RCT, they were able to show that an AI-assisted uh, uh, segmentation tool can, improving, uh, can improve echo lab efficiency as well as the accuracy uh, when comparing AI to the sonographer uh, segmentations. So uh, this actually leads to a less retracing time, about 10%, uh, less retracing of the segmentation. So AI only had 16%-ish, uh, but with sonographers, the final reading position uh, had to retrace it about like a 27% out of, uh, of time. And then it also leads to more uh, better efficient, probably say uh, sonographers two minutes per study and eight seconds for physicians per study. So, uh, however, uh, we can still see the limitations from the current available AI models. Uh, first of all, uh, these models are actually focused on more uh, narrowed uh, task, uh, is uh, only including, say, disease classification or segmentation of the images. So this uh, effort does not really reflect the true effort or the recognition, um, uh, uh, sorry, cognitive work, a radiologist or a cardiologist interpreting the whole study. Say like we need to uh, take a look at the whole study and then uh, associate all these informations uh, related to patient's history and all the information and put that together as a, a final report. And then uh, this uh, models can also have uh, some of them can also have questionable generalization capacity. Like when we have different disease prevalence, uh, the disease classification model can be a problem. And then uh, when we have different uh, image modality at different institutions, that segmentation, that segmentation model could have a problem. Uh, and uh, uh, the last one is uh, uh, a relatively limited human AI interaction uh, through these more conventional deep learning models. Uh, so these are the limitations we could see uh, from the current approaches. So the next nature of question that we would ask is that what can we imagine the next generation of AI models in echocardiography interpretation or more generalized in medicine? So uh, I would say we would thinking about a co-pilot, like a, uh, when we are reading the study, uh, the, the AI system can help us to generate the whole study and also refer to patient's background information, uh, either from the EHR, from the EKG signals, or even related this to uh, different medical domain knowledge, including the latest publications, and give you some recommendation or help you to put this report together um, as a uh, final output of uh, this uh, echo study effort. And then uh, even in the report part, it can have flexible interactions. You can revise report or ask the model uh, or the system to give you a, some feedback or um, recommendations based on uh, the current banks. 
So uh, back to our uh, echo interpretation system, uh, it can be visualized as somewhat simplified uh, problem statement. So uh, the question is, we want to give the, an echo cartography image or videos to a visual linguistic model and then a uh, uh, system. And then we want to generate a structure report. So that would be the problem statement here. But before answering this question, uh, before address this problem, we do have some fundamental questions to ask. As we know, uh, echo cartography studies are actually a mix of image and video. Well, right now, when we do the interpretation, we're kind of extracting the information from um, uh, the still frames or from uh, when, when we do measurement, we actually extract that information from still frames, not based on the whole video. So one question is that uh, with image captioning or video captioning uh, uh, models more feasible, which one is more feasible uh, in tackling this problem? And then second one is, are the current uh, VLM captioning, uh, are they sufficient for a clinically meaningful uh, report? So these are very basic questions that we want to answer. Uh, we do have a proposed framework. Uh, this is a um, uh, referred to a, another tricycle study, uh, but I replace that uh, the framework with an echo category. So basically, we put in our echo uh, either images or videos, and through this framework, uh, the, the the data will go through a disease classifier that gives you a certain diagnosis of diseases, and then uh, you will have a segmentator a segmentor that gives you the uh, quantitative measurements, including the uh, Part size or a specific um, quantitative measurement you want. And then there is a report generator that is the VLM model that gives you an overall uh, semantic captioning uh, on what is being seen on the set. And then put everything together as a prompt test and feed that into a large language model. And then uh, you will have a, a report uh, at the end. And then uh, as a interpreting position, you can still ask the model or the system to revise the report and then uh, uh, to have the warranted output you want. So a uh, more visualized uh, kind of simplified visualization of this system would uh, be three different uh, major modules. Uh, we would have the infrastructure or the pre-processing module that includes uh, image quality uh, classifier. Like if you have uh, pretty bad quality, you probably can't do anything or tell anything out from that. And we need a view classifier to pick up the right views. And we need a cardiac based uh, classifier to pick up the right base for us to do uh, the correct measurements. And then uh, we need a, a core echo interpretation module that will be based on visual linguistic foundation model. And then we also need to have the specialist models that give you diagnosis or give you uh, the segmentation that you want. And everything will be put together into the report organization module uh, or a human AI interface that is a, a frozen uh, large language model at the end. So, so here's the uh, uh, proposal about uh, what our study is going to do. Uh, so first of all, uh, in the blue block, uh, we're going to evaluate which kind of uh, uh, visual linguistic model works better uh, for tackling echo reporting uh, problem. And uh, we kind of simplify this problem in this proto, uh, prototype of system. Uh, we want to just use one of the views uh, out from the whole study, uh, make sure that uh, this pipeline will work, and then we can further expand that to uh, uh, covering different views uh, out from the uh, echo standard echo cardiac study. And then with these visual linguistic model, we anticipate that uh, it can generate some high-level context uh, in a semantic uh, captioning, uh, say enlarged uh, ventricle size, normal systolic function, and then there's possible elevated skeletal pressure, so like that. And then in, uh, once we decided which one, the image captioning or the video captioning model works better, we will add the expert models, including the segmentation or specific diagnosis models into the framework, and then um, let the large, large language model to organize uh, the report and see how good it is compared to uh, expert evaluation. So uh, talking about the uh, echo interpretation module, uh, that would be the visual linguistic model. Uh, right now, we have tested it on the small cat model, which is the image captioning. So basically, it's a, a, a model based on the retrieval mechanism and uses CLIP as well as a GPD-2 decoder uh, to generalize captions. Um, right now, uh, we uh, extract data from about 7,000 uh, echo net videos, uh, one frame out on that. And then we find this on a pre-trained small cat models uh, with an example captioning saying like either L ventricle is normal or enlarged, 
uh, the logarithmical projection fraction is normal or decreased. Yeah, so right now the caption is relatively limited because the uh, publicly available equivalent data only describes uh, numerical measurements on the uh, LB size, also as LB systolic function. There is no uh, certain report text associated with it. So we basically use some uh, guideline cutoff to turn this into relatively simple statements uh, as our uh, text ground truth. And then, um, so here's our cooling result. Uh, with this uh, 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 fine tuning process, we're able to get a blue score on the LV size about 0.8, uh, and the cystoid function was like a uh, 0.96 ish. And then overall, by saying like putting this together, we have about like 0.86 uh, blue, blue score. Uh, and on the right hand side is an example of it. Uh, so it says that the ventricle size is large, and then the cystoid function is normal. Uh, and which correspond to the original um, uh, measurement uh, pretty accurately. So uh, EDD was 190 is large, and then uh, EF was up 53% is actually within the normal range. So uh, for the interpretation module, uh, we have the expert models that we have been working on and developed. Uh, so, uh, so for these expert models, uh, we do have segmentation and function assessments. Um, so first, uh, we actually just used the uh, segment everything model uh, to fine tune it on the EchoNet uh, data set to do our LB segmentation. Uh, we're trying to uh, put this effort together so like everything can be uh, more more or less based on the foundation model. So we'll have more uh, flexibility to fine tune on different uh, data set or like for future changes based on imaging modality. And then we have the basal function model. And for diagnosis, uh, we do have uh, cardiac homologosis uh, and uh, constrictor pancreatitis model. Um, so uh, here's the performance on our uh, of our same. Uh, we're still fine tuning it, but even with the zero shot, the same uh, model has been doing pretty good. Uh, so for example, for the dice score uh, on the train uh, validation and test, it reaches about like 0.86. Of note, uh, the uh, original echo net model uh, has an end diastolic frame uh, uh, that score of 0 0.9 and end systolic frames of like a 0 0.92. So even with zero shot, uh, SAM do have a pretty good or reasonably good uh, performance on this. So, uh, and then I actually want to explain the uh, rationale of why we choose those uh, specialty or expert models in the beginning. Uh, of course, we want to expand that module to allow uh, more uh, various and different uh, diagnoses, but uh, we did pick up several of the most important ones uh, in echocardiography assessment. So here, the diastolic function model, uh, so which also uh, diastolic function assessment is actually a more complicated issue in cardiology. Uh, so, uh, you know, the heart uh, contracts, and then, but it also relaxes. But the relaxed part is actually more, uh, I mean, not that straightforward compared to uh, systolic. Uh, so we have a pretty unique, uh, uh, we, we have a um, system to help us to do the diagnostic uh, on diastolic function, but it's relatively a more complex evaluation. Uh, and uh, uh, in the current system, uh, there, there's like about 25% chance that you can end up with like, a, I don't know how bad or how good the diastolic function is. And, but of note, diastolic function uh, or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction uh, is actually equally bad uh, as patients with reduced uh, ejection fraction. The five year, uh, five year uh, uh, patients, about like a, uh, sorry, <clears throat> about 75% of patients actually died uh, at five years. And in the past, we have no treatment on this, but recently we do have new therapeutic drugs uh, became available. So uh, being able to identify these patients uh, at an earlier time and then try to uh, give them appropriate therapy becomes more and more important. Um, so uh, the second one is the amyloidosis as well as the uh, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy model. So pretty often we see uh, echo uh, we see patients with increased uh, left ventricular wall thickness, uh, but we don't know uh, which kind of diagnosis or which kind of pathology they have online. So this will include uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, amyloidosis as well as uh, pretty much just caused by hypertensive change. So uh, in, in the past, uh, this kind of work would lead a lot of uh, uh, effort, including uh, cardiac MRI and nuclear studies to really uh, give a certain diagnosis uh, to these patients with increased uh, LV wall thickness. Uh, but a, a echo-based deep learning model can actually to facilitate the process or at least guide uh, where uh, should we go uh, in terms of making the correct diagnosis.
And uh, uh, with an uh, echo model, we do have an, um, uh, an ROC that reaching about 8.95 in differentiating uh, all three uh, different conditions. Um, and then another uh, important disease is uh, constrictive peritonitis. So this is actually one disease that is considered as a classical um, hemodynamic problem when we're trying to address the uh, uh, cardiac amyloidosis. So basically, they have very similar uh, hemodynamic performance, and it's very difficult to diagnose uh, in the clinical practice. So uh, with this, we also have a pretty good uh, um, results. So uh, from the left to right, I actually summarized all the performance on these axonarms together. So for the diastolic function model, uh, we have about 0.84 and then on our CAUC. And then for uh, this uh, construction, uh, we have a uh, pretty high about to like 0.97, and which is still good on the external validation set, which was about 0.84, 0.85 in terms of AUC. And then uh, for uh, differentiating uh, cardiac amyloidosis from all brain diseases, uh, we have about like a 0.84 kind of performance. So, uh, so those are the uh, expert models. And then I'll talk about our report organization module, which is the large language model at the end. Um, so uh, for the report, we actually want this report to be uh, pretty uh, organized and then uh, predictable uh, because if we just allow the, the, the language model to generate everything on its own, it could be just like a uh, uh, randomly come out with different things that you don't want to see uh, in that. And uh, also importantly, we want to avoid any uh, hallucinations from the language model. So we actually provided a preset structural report, which is actually also being used in our echo lab. So basically, uh, these reports uh, come in with spaces. So the um, language model can actually fill in uh, those information uh, it got uh, from the uh, prior um, different specialty different models. Uh, so, uh, and then, uh, so this report part will become more a prompt engineering task. So it basically provides uh, to the uh, GPT 3.5 uh, with the uh, rules uh, for it to act, uh, act as an expert echocardiographic decision to summarize those information just by uh, replacing the space in the preset templates. And then uh, if needed, it can provide additional details uh, that is not contained uh, in those uh, uh, information. And then uh, also effort to uh, uh, address, uh, avoid any uh, hallucinations, saying like if the information is not available from the provided uh, data, so just say like it cannot be evaluated. Uh, and problem number two, uh, problem number two is that a, just a revise on from from number one. Basically, it in, because we introduce the expert or the specialist network models into that, we actually want to avoid the uh, information showing up in the final uh, in the final report. This is because we want to have an um, uh, echo expert to give us um, uh, like a human based human expert based review. So we want to don't want to actually show the AI information in that. Otherwise, it's very easy for them to identify, oh, these are AI models, and they can be biased based on that. Um, so uh, here are simulated tests. Uh, so uh, on the left-hand side is a high-level context primer stating about the heart condition. Uh, we uh, talk about like a LV size uh, and the ejection fraction, also the RV size and the mitral regurgitation. So on the right-hand side, you can see that it actually formulated the report uh, pretty well as expected. And importantly, on the red, on the, on the, uh, red uh, label text, it was able to pick up some information that were not uh, provided in this uh, uh, high-level context. So we actually avoid uh, hallucination in our final report uh, for that. Um, so and when we try to uh, introduce the expert model inputs, uh, so on the left-hand side, you can see that when we uh, introduce the amyloidosis network and then the HCM network, um, uh, on the right hand side, it turns more into a uh, rational uh, description uh, of these uh, model outputs without really mentioning that these are like okay, from AI models. Uh, and uh, an additional thing is that the model actually picks up a relatively subtle thing, but it actually mentions oh, we don't have uh, any uh, atrial size that is measured. And which is inconsistent with the model findings about like a amyloidosis, which is a little more subtle. But actually, uh, we are le with this, we're actually showing uh, the mod we're leveraging the model's medical knowledge because um, the in especially in cases with amyloidosis, uh, we usually see enlarged atrial sizes. 
So the model actually detects something that was inconsistent between our high-level context and the expert models, which is what we want. Um, and also, uh, this is another simulated test uh, for the model to compare uh, the report level changes, because it's important for us to know, like, okay, when a patient has serial studies, we want to know uh, how much has changed, uh, how good is the function compared to the prior one. So uh, at the report level, the model can actually uh, compare the text and uh, see how much difference is happening between those. And this is a summary from that. Um, so uh, at the end, I actually want to uh, emphasize the advantage of using a large language model uh, in such a system. Uh, number one, I think uh, most importantly is we are leveraging the logical reasoning ability of these models in organizing our uh, output from different uh, models, including the uh, visual linguistic model as well as the specialist models. And then we want to leverage this medical knowledge uh, in addressing the difference uh, or the inconsistencies that may happen uh, uh, between different model outputs and give us the most reasonable uh, prediction for the uh, finalized reports. And then uh, with such a uh, design, we won't have the flexibility of the whole system. For example, uh, we can replace uh, any of the uh, units uh, and without really retrain the whole system. And then we can just like a fine tune. Say, for example, when the diagnosis criteria changed, we probably need to update one of the models uh, to give like a uh, the correct or updated diagnosis criteria. And, and we can simply by doing just uh, fine tuning the single model or from the whole system, not replacing the retrain the whole system. Uh, and then uh, it can also us to uh, allow us to expand the whole system in, uh, like a, by adding more units or more modules to meet our diagnostic needs. And then uh, with a large language model, especially a chatbot, uh, it can actually be in a pretty good human AI interface. For example, I can ask the model to give me a comparison or to give uh, to revise the report according to what I want. And uh, this is not seen uh, by the previous efforts uh, of uh, echo uh, interpretation autom automation process. So, uh, and I want to talk about some limitations and future steps we're taking. Uh, so right now, our, our proposal or the prototype is only based on one view. And like I say, uh, plan to further expand this into uh, multiple views, or at least uh, covering the standardized uh, echo category views. Uh, so to allow a whole uh, perspective of the heart. And then right now, the expert disease models, uh, these are like a more conventional individual classification models. So one of the direction on this effort is we're trying to uh, have a uh, self-supervised uh, multi-class uh, labeling uh, model uh, to address uh, this uh, the, the current uh, expert disease models. And then we don't have a framework that allows to longitud for longitudinal comparison on studies uh, in terms of in terms of image. But using the large language model, we can actually do a comparison based on the report level, uh, which is actually uh, constraints do. Like when we're looking at comparing studies, sometimes we don't have the time to really dig into the whole study, so we do the report level comparison. So that's somewhat addressing this need uh, to have the uh, long stream comparison. So at the end, I do want to uh, thank to this uh, uh, excellent and the fascinating team across uh, Maryland and Stanford, and that's everyone's effort to uh, make this system could be possible. Well, thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions.